Hajme Mashte. Hello and good evening. I'm Piggy Banks and this is the first ever episode of Back to the Banks with Piggy Banks. In today's show, I will be offering as much context as I can for what this show is actually going to be about, as well as showing you the first ever English coverage of a domestic Japanese Karen race on the internet. We'll be diving into the nuts and bolts of this extremely dense, endlessly mysterious enigma of a sport in the hopes that we can better understand the peripheral information that surrounds what I believe to be the most exciting and dynamic form of professional bicycle racing on the planet. Now, Karen is first and foremost a gambling sport. More about that later, but I'm mentioning it here so that I can make it clear that this show will not be about gambling. I will inevitably have to talk about it sometimes because it is intrinsically linked to the sport but it will be a very minor part of the show. Mainly because this form of gambling is very much a way for parasitic corporations to profit from low-income communities, but also because I'm far more interested in talking about cool people riding bikes really fast. By the way, I just want to thank those parasitic corporations from before, because without their gambling racket I would have no content for this show. So what is Japanese Karen? Why the fuck am I here? This has actually been covered pretty well by Western sources mainly because the JKA Foundation actually invites global elite track sprinters to race alongside locals in short exhibition seasons. If you'd like a brief introduction, I would recommend the documentary by Nowness called Karen Speed Races, as well as Ryoku, which follows Australian cyclist Shane Perkins through one of those exhibition seasons I mentioned before. What I'm saying is what Karen is, or at least what the West perceives it to be, has already been explained numerous times in English by actual professional journalists, so I'm going to try not to tread the same ground as those productions. Instead, I want this show to be a slow but complete exposure to the very nature of what Karen actually is, what it is to me, and what it can be for you. Karen is not a gambling sport. Karen is not an underground sport. Karen is not a sport at all. Karen is an underworld. The nature of Karen is so self-contained, so specific to itself as to alienate everything else. Karen recognizes Karen and that's it. Everything that tries to go into the Karen becomes part of the Karen, and you can't take the Karen out of the Karen once it's in there. You can try, as many have. You can build a Karen bike, with all NJS parts down to the Araya 16B tubular rims, but once you take it to a place that isn't Karen, it isn't Karen anymore. This is the first thing we have to accept as outsider Karen fans. We are just that, outside. And we must watch forlornly from afar as this machine drones on, never to know us, never to want us. However, watching from the sidelines doesn't have to suck, and in fact it's going to be pretty lit, because we're going to learn everything about this. I'm going to learn Japanese for this shit. Watashi no Nihongo wa dame desu. That means my Japanese is terrible, but I'm still going to do it, because I love this. I've loved this since I was 15 years old, when I first stumbled upon an article about Karen in an Australian cycling magazine, and now I feel competent enough about it to make videos attempting to explain it and its appeal. Emphasis on attempt here. I'm not even close to bilingual yet, and as such I will be very prone to issues like mistranslation and misunderstanding of certain things due to lack of cultural context. I will always do my best to remain true to the source material. Certain aspects may be simplified or exaggerated for the benefit of the viewers of the show, but I would never intentionally supply a misinterpretation of what's going on. This is important. Because the main function of this show is to provide accurate English coverage of a small proportion of selected Karen events. This is for the entertainment of non-Japanese speaking fans and for the exposure to international acclaim of the athletes involved. Because you should know who Sato Shintaro is. There is no good reason you should know Chris Froome and not Sato Shintaro. Thanks for listening to my rant. Now I'm actually going to explain some stuff with gross oversimplification. World War II happened. We all know what happened to Japan at the end of the war. It was a fuck situation, and I'm not here to talk about that. But the catalyst for Kirin was the fact that Japan had a lot of rebuilding to do and no money because war is expensive, and losing a war is even more expensive. 
Because there was a demand for affordable transport and because automobiles are very expensive to both produce and consume, bicycle production expanded from around 100,000 to 1 million units annually from 1946 to 1950. Japan's rise to become the engineering superpower it is today is very much the result of this fledgling bicycle industry being so successful. So it's 1948, shit is just pretty depressing in general, the government is broke, the people are broke, but there are a bunch of tanky steel utilitarian bikes around called Mamacheri. I couldn't find too much information on specifics, but it seems someone working for the government had the idea to make lemonade with those Mamacheri lemons. The concept was simple, get some bikes together, get some dudes together, make the dudes race each other on the bikes, place bets on the dudes, pay some winnings to the people who guessed the right dudes, and take all the money from the people who guessed the wrong dudes. It's just so simple and it works every time. On November 20th, 1948, the first Karen event was held at Kokuro Karen Velodrome in Fukuoka Prefecture, and it looked like this. Riders lined up on clunky cruiser bikes and raced on what was probably a pretty makeshift velodrome. In spite of this, 55,000 people came to watch it and it made over 19 million yen, which is 1.9 million US dollars adjusted for inflation. The government and the people looked at each other and collectively said, <laughs> And in 1949, the sport exploded, with many events taking place that still happen every year to this day. They even introduced women's Karen in 1949, which ran until 1964 before being cancelled and then reintroduced in 2011 after 47 years of sexist exclusion. It's very obvious that girls' Karen serves a very different purpose to the men's racing for the JKA Foundation, and the shitty politics behind this will also be getting its own video. In 1957, the Nihon Jitensha Shinkokai, or NJS, was formed to create a universal standard for all these independent Karen events. You've probably heard people talk about NJS bikes and parts. Some people even refer to Karen as NJS, or call the league that oversees events the NJS. But NJS really just refers to the set of universal standards. Parts approved for Karen racing have an NJS stamp to prove they are legal for competition and the standards are all designed to give every competitor an equal chance of success in terms of equipment. The body that actually oversees the running of Karen events is the Japanese Karen Auto Race Foundation, or JKA Foundation. These people are basically the league, and coordinate with local velodromes to ensure there is an even spread of events, as well as providing the necessary information for all events on a central platform. I use the JKA Foundation's website, Karen.jp, for almost all of my research. There are 43 independent Karen velodromes currently in operation, and each one is run by its own company. Races take place almost every day, and events are almost never cancelled or postponed. There are often multiple different events happening around the country on any given day, and this is very much by design to ensure that no potential gambler need ever be left idle. Because most of the velodromes are placed outside and because races must take place in all weather conditions, Karen tracks have a sandpaper-like surface to prevent accidents in wet weather. The unfortunate side effect of this is when crashes happen, and they happen a lot, there's going to be a, a lot of damage! To counteract this somewhat, Karen riders wear plastic armor, similar to a motocross chest plate, and big domey helmets. They also typically cover the exposed skin on their legs with a lubricant, which helps a little with sliding along the track. Over the armor, riders wear numbered jerseys of a corresponding color. I'm going to be doing a specific video about NJS bikes and equipment, but humor me for a quick overview. Men's Karen equipment is extremely standardized, and with very few exceptions, it is all based on technology that was available in the late 70s. This is because after this period, many manufacturers began to innovate and develop bikes that became ever more different to each other. This was the beginning of the marginal gains carbon fiber aerodynamic lightweight stiffness arms race that we live in today. Because Karen is about gambling, with athleticism being more of an afterthought, allowing riders to use different bikes would potentially make it easier to guess the outcome of races, i.e. faster bikes are more likely to win. Karen is only profitable if it is impossible to predict the outcome, and all decisions within Karen are made with this in mind. Women's Karen allows 2010-era technology, 
but the list of acceptable parts is much shorter than the men's and the full list of acceptable parts for both fits on two pages. To become a Karen champ, you must first attend the Japan Karen School. This is basically Hogwarts for cyclists and it is where I would live if I could choose to. The school is designed to transform a rank amateur from any sporting background into a professional racer who knows all the rules in less than a year, and as such it is very regimented and strict. In Karen school you will wake up early as fuck and endure a brutal training regime based on 1980s sports science for most of the day. The time you spend not training will either be spent on vigorous study of rules and tactics or consuming as many calories as a sumo wrestler. It's a hard life, not everyone makes it, and those that do emerge as hardened professionals. When you graduate, if you are a man, you will go to the A3 class, and if you are a woman, you will go to the L class, which is the only class for women. If you are a man and you are successful, you will ascend from A3 to A2, A2 to A1, A1 to S2, S2 to S1, and if you are ranked inside the top 9 in the league, you will get a spot in the SS class. There are also grades for Karen events. F2 is for A class only. F1 is for A and S. G3 is open only to S class. G2, which is for special events, only open to S class. And GP grade, which covers only the GP. The SS class, awkwardly named, are the only riders invited to compete in the grand final of the Karen Grand Prix, which is by far the biggest and most lucrative event on the calendar. The Super Bowl, if you will. It is the goal of every Karen rider to make it here. To advance to the next class, you must demonstrate you are too strong for the class you are in. To do this, you must increase your race score, which is by far the most important statistic for predicting the outcome of a race. I affectionately refer to this number as the power level. It is more or less an ELO. If you win or place well, it will increase, and if you achieve minor placings or come last, it will decrease. If you get your power level over 140, you'll be promoted to the next class if possible, and if it goes lower than 50 depending on your class, you will likely be demoted or fired outright. There are a bunch of other statistics, but I'm going to cover those and the gambling system in a separate video, because I think a lot of people may find it boring. Now let's talk about the racing itself before we go into our breakdown. In a man's race, there are typically 9 riders, although due to things like COVID and a limited pool of talent, they can be run with as few as 6. Women's races are supposed to include seven, but are also sometimes run with six. A nine rider race is much preferred by both the organizers and the punters, because the odds of a given result are lower and as a result payout is higher. It also creates a set of circumstances that allows Karen's deeper ideas to form and play out. In a typical event, nine riders will line up side by side on an electronic starting gate for a 2025 meter race on a track that is between 333 to 500 meters long, but is usually 400 meters. The thing that distinguishes Karen from other track cycling events is the fact that the first three and a half laps of the five lap race are neutralized and competitors ride behind a pace setter. Overtaking the pace setter in this period means disqualification, and because it is easier to draft behind somebody, an orderly chain of nine riders generally forms behind the pace setter. Where in this chain you start from has very significant consequences during the race, so there is often some jockeying for position early on. Being directly behind the pace setter has the advantage of starting from first place, plus you only have to cover moves that come from behind without having to fight through the pack. The downsides to this position are pretty significant too though. When the pace setter pulls off, you are by default breaking the wind for everyone else. You are also very prone to a swamp attack, where a line of riders accelerates early before the pace setter pulls off and then instantly overtakes the front rider at a high speed when they do. It is extremely difficult to defend from this tactic, and even if you do, you will spend a lot of energy accelerating enough to do it. The last rider in the chain has almost the opposite conditions. They are in last place by default and must travel farther than everyone else, through everyone else. They do have the advantage of having the option to join every overtaking move, and they will always be riding through broken wind. Every other position in this chain has conditions that are some hybrid between these extremes, and all have their own pros and cons. Typically the best position is to be the second or third rider in what is known as a line. Line is basically the core concept of the Karen races themselves. A perfect line is a group of three riders who know each other well and have raced and trained together a lot. Each rider has a clearly defined role to play and each rider seeks success for the whole group, but victory for themselves. 
In Karen, you must attempt to win. So a line is not a team. A team sacrifices individual glory for the glory of the team. A line is made up of people that are still competing with each other, but working together. A rider in a line will be either a senko, a makuri, or an oikumi. A senko is the first in the line. They will start their sprint with over a lap to go, and it is their job to get the line to the front of the race. Senko is the hardest role, and usually goes to young riders trying to prove themselves to seasoned veterans. Makuri rides behind a senko and attempts to overtake late on the last lap. They have the job of sweeping, which is swinging from side to side to block any attempts to overtake. Oikumi is the last rider in the line, and they will attempt to overtake on the home stretch when everyone is tired. Like the Makuri, they also have the job of blocking everyone else trying to get past. Oikumi is a role favoured by Karen's seniors. It's possible to race professionally for a very long time, and many keep competing until their 60s. Now I've described the perfect line, I should mention that in reality they hardly ever happen. What we usually see is imperfect lines of two or three, and individuals who just have to do what they can on their own. A typical Karen tournament will go for three days, with 10 to 12 races per day. In the first two days, riders will race once per day, and on the last day everyone is placed into finals based on the day one and two performances. All riders must stay in a dormitory on the velodrome premises, and are not allowed any contact with the outside world to prevent match fixing. This creates quite a communal atmosphere, and this is where lines, and more importantly, relationships, are formed. There are many different kinds of tournaments. Some take place at night, some go for more days, and many have historical significance. But I'm also going to talk more about those in another video. A Karen rider is an independent contractor who owns all of their equipment. They make their living, which ranges from meager to astronomical, by taking part in and attempting to win Karen races and tournaments. The tournaments are run by independent velodromes and are overseen by the JKA Foundation. All equipment is NJS approved. There are around 2,700 professional Karen riders, and as many unique characters. No race is ever the same, and for about a minute each time, anything can happen. It is truly never over until it's over. Karen is an underworld. As we said, this is the seventh race of the fourth day of the All Japan Karen Championships. We've got our riders heading out the fighting gate here. Some really nice looking bikes there. They are all so different. This is no small potatoes. This is all of Japan. The atmosphere is pretty tense to be fair. It's looking a little bit uh, morose as they come out onto the track from the riders gate also known as the fighting gate in some places. So I really love that graphic that's just come up on the screen. Reminds me a lot of Attack on Titan. I'm sure I have some anime fans in the audience just based on the demographic of this show. And we are lining up. This is a nine rider race, which has been pretty rare recently. I've seen a lot of seven rider races just due, I'm assuming, to COVID just the uh, the lockdown situations going on in Japan right now so so, so typically the announcer will announce everybody's name and where they're from. I'm going to provide my translation after that. I just wanted you to hear the Japanese version. Uh, that won't normally be an occurrence. Uh, I'm just mostly going to be rolling with English, but uh, it's nice for you to get a, an appreciation for like the, the full circle of this. Uh, so we got number seven looking pretty dope there. 
orange is a slow color in my opinion, so I always consider that to be a disadvantage. Me and my girlfriend have arguments about this sometimes, but uh, yeah, not one for me. I'm all about green. Green is pretty fast color in my opinion, and I also like pink. I'm wearing the, the pink Kering jersey today. Number one, Keita Ibane from Chiba. Number two, Totori Yugo from Okayama. Number three, Keiwada from Miyagi. Number four, Kenta Inake from Wakayama. Number five, Daishiku Hara from Yamaguchi. Number six, Takashi Sakamoto from Amuri. Seven, Wada Makuru from Kanagawa. Eight, Kazuki Yamashita from Yamaguchi. And nine, Shinichi Yamamoto from Kyoto. So I've got to start. Everybody is looking around a lot. That's usually a pretty good sign that there is some predetermined tactics about to be employed here. Uh, you can see nobody's really content just to sit where they are. Everyone's riding high, looking around. Uh, so people definitely have plans for, for what's about to go down here. You see number four and number nine just deciding amongst themselves who's going to be taking the pace set as well. And uh, yeah, a little bit of little bit of shuffling around going on early on today. Pace sitter, always just setting about his business. He has a lot better things to do than worry about this race. Uh, so we've got four laps to go. Uh, two more laps of neutralized racing. So we're probably not going to see too much action in that time. Uh, but it is a good opportunity to point out this really nice Kalavinka that uh, number five is we're riding here. It's a really nice fork juxtaposed against the pearl white frame there. And I really like the I really like some of these rigs that these boys put together. And and the girls too. There's some fucking dope girls carrying bikes also. Some fucking dope girls carrying bikes also. Alright, so we're coming through the home straight. We have got three laps to go now. And we are starting to move around with some purpose. You can see number three is not going to be content to stay in last position for very long, especially with this sprint starting in about a lap's time. And we are going to see number six take the initiative, and number three, thankfully, is going to be on that wheel, going to get nice and even with the front runners, so as not to be put at a massive disadvantage. Is a commendable tactic for sure. So they've actually managed to overtake the front, who shouldn't, who didn't put up much of a fight. So it's probably not really in the tactics of number four to be uh, to be sitting on the front. But we've got a big acceleration here from Orange uh, number seven, and number four has decided now might be the time to make the move. So it looks like number four is riding with a bit of a Senko tactic, but still looking around a lot. And we have an awesome Senko tactic from number two, riding up really high. And of course, when you drop down the bank, you would get acceleration. So they have managed to overtake number four with ease. And you see number four just getting completely blown out the back of this now. And the pace is immensely high. So number two is managing to hold it all the way into the line. Number five looks like he's going to McCurdy and take that away, doing some massive sweeps. And that was just incredible. You, could, uh, you can really see how even they all get with each other on that last straight. That's why the tracks need to be so wide. Uh, but no sign of number four in there. He was, yes, as we see here, he was gone from the beginning. But uh, very, very good race from Niban, which is number two. Very strong Senko lead out. The McCurry doing a, a great job of blocking and sweeping for the Senko. And you see he is rewarded by, it looks like a second place. But I think when we go back to the replay, we actually see he got pipped by number nine, who was just all over the show during that race. He was up and down, riding on the, on the pace sitter at one point. And uh, yeah, really like traded positions a lot during that race. Um, but it was very impressive to see number two's long and strong lap. Very cool shot as they all come over. And they have to be really careful even when they are finishing because a lot of crashes happen when they roll over the line just because they're so close together and moving so fast. 
So now we get the official results. So number two and number nine and number seven, they are our one, two, and three. Uh, just has to, the announcement just has to be delayed a little because they have to go to the video referee and make sure everything was all above board. Uh, I'm not sure what happened with number four because you are definitely supposed to keep riding. So something may have happened to them. And then, uh, yeah, she's just going to announce the payouts for the various different bets that were available. Uh, only the winning bets get read out, obviously. Um, but yeah, some really good money to be made there, I'm sure. Uh, so thank you for sitting in with this. This was the, the first ever breakdown on the channel. Uh, it's obviously going to get a lot better from this point, but it's, it's really good just to show kind of an example of what I am trying to create here. So uh, thank you very much, arigatou gozaimasu, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.